Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. So today in the last part of this discussion on responsible relationships. How many of you are there for any of the first three parts? Okay, some of you are there. So in the first part I talked about how hurt people hurt people. So when somebody is hurting us, rather than feeling resentful towards them, why is this person do like this to me? We can try to see from their perspective how they are hurt. And that can create empathy. Then second session I talked about how we need to make judgments, but we should be judgmental. Is we can't fix labels on people permanently. That impedes us in proper communication with them and prevents the deepening of the relationship. Then the third session, I talk about how <clears throat> amidst difficult situations, you know, we need to respond by choosing one of three options. That is, we focus on not other people's behaviors, but our own values. I talk about tolerate, mitigate, and emigrate. Three options. So today, in the last session, <coughs> I talk about how we need to look up before we look around. That means that for all of us, we have different relationships in the world, and our most important relationship is the vertical relationship, that is the relationship with Krishna. All other relationships are horizontal relationships. And they are all important in their own way. At the same time, none of the horizontal relationships are eternal. And we all get a sense of our identity and our self-worth from our relationships. Say, for example, if our children do nicely, then we feel satisfied that I am a good parent. So, our sense of identity comes from that relationship. One of the greatest fears today in the, in the 21st century is a fear that is related with relationships. If we consider the fears, the top 10 fears that people had in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century, two new fears have been added in the 21st century. One is the fear of terrorists. And the second is the fear of rejection. That we may try to form a relationship with somebody may reject me, somebody may abandon me. So that fear is there because it's not just the fear that that particular relationship may break. The fear is also that when that relationship, some relationship doesn't work out, then we feel as if I am unworthy to be loved. Whenever some relationship doesn't work out, we feel unloved. But if a relation, if some relationships, many relationships don't seem to be working out, then we start feeling that I am not only unloved, but that I am unlovable. And that feeling can be devastating. So the bhakti tradition helps us to understand that we are neither unloved nor unlovable. Because Krishna always loves us. Krishna is always present in our hearts. Sarvasya jaham rudhisan nivishto. He is present in our hearts and he is there because he cares for us. And he cares for us and that's why he wants to guide us. Ishvara sarva bhutanam rudhese anjanatishthati brahmyan sarva bhutani yantra rodani mayayan. 1861 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that he guided the man dreams of everyone. So Krishna is closer to us and the closest person to us can ever be. Even if they have us in the tightest of paths, still that person can't come as close to us ever as Krishna always is. And that Krishna, he is the supreme person. So that relationship has to be the basis of our identity. That has to be our fundamental shelter. Uh, then 
when we have the security of the relationship with Krishna, then even if we experience some ups and downs in our horizontal relationships, we can cope with them. We can see any problem, we can see even a failure in a relationship as a bump on the road. But if a relationship has become the basis of our identity or the sole basis of our identity, then if that relationship doesn't work out, then we see it not as a bump on the road of life, but as the end of the road of life. My life itself has become meaningless. This happens many times in a romantic relationships. If there is a breakup, people go to depression. Sometimes people even become suicidal. That's because they have defined themselves in terms of that relationship. So the only relationship we should define ourselves in terms of fundamentally is our relationship with Krishna. Jivera Swarupore, Krishnaira Nityadavas. And the more we practice bhakti and connect with Krishna, the more we'll be able to stabilize ourselves in all our relationships. So when we practice bhakti, we get that inner security, inner strength that Krishna is with me. And Yamuna Charity Stotratna says, Bhaganda Mevanu Charan Nirantara Prashant so he is praying to the Lord, Bhavantam. My dear Lord, ever since Evan Charan Nirantara, I have started serving you continuously. What has happened? Prashantani Shesha Manohura Bhantara. The mind is like a, on a wild chariot, always running here, there, everywhere. But now it has become calm. Prashantani Shesha, it has become very calm. Then, does that calmness mean passivity? That I don't do anything? No. He says, now also I have aspiration in my life. And what are my aspirations? When can I realize that my dear Lord, I am your eternal servant and brother Shishami Sanavatvajivitam and when can I delight in this relationship understanding that I have such a wonderful Lord that we are Sarnath, we have a Lord, a protector and Prabha Shishami, in understanding his glories, in relishing his glories, that is the joy of our life. This, when we start practicing bhakti, what happens is our appreciation of Krishna's glories increases. And when we feel such a wonderful Lord is there in my heart, and we, deal, we get security, we get serenity, we get ecstasy in that relationship with Krishna. And then, when that relationship with Krishna is stable, then we can, we don't get that agitated by ups and downs in our horizontal relationships. The Lord, how far is Krishna from us right now? What do you think? Sorry? He's very near, he's in our hearts. He's one? One car is here, very small. So actually, you can say Krishna is just one thought away from us. Krishna is close to us, but in the sense we are far away from him. Because we have turned away from him. But if we just think of him, if we just try to direct our thoughts towards him, we can connect with him. And as we practice Bhakti Yoga, our thoughts become more consistent, more focused. Then we can start feeling his presence. So this is Krishna. The whole process of Krishna consciousness is the process of direct connecting with Krishna through our thoughts and thereby experiencing shelter in that relationship with Krishna. So the foundation for any responsible relationship is taking responsibility for our relationship with Krishna. 
Because once that relationship is stable, then other relationships can be stabilized thereafter. So any questions or comments at this point? Okay. So the second point which I'll make on this now is that when we act in any relationship, so we practice bhakti to stabilize the vertical relationship, to get strength in that. And then in the horizontal relationship when we act, there will there be times when we like someone. So sometimes we just can't tolerate that person. And it is not that to the same person, one day we may feel, oh, such a wonderful person. Some, sometimes we feel such an unbearable person. So sometimes we get too caught with our emotions. And sometimes we feel, yeah, I should not be feeling like this. And sometimes I'm feeling like this, why am I, why am I angry in this relationship? So here, it's an important thing to understand that trying to control our emotions is nearly an impossible task. Instead, we can focus on taking, we can, instead of trying to control how we feel, we can take control of how we act, of what we do. What is the difference between the two? That feelings are like the weather. The weather changes unpredictably. And sometimes it is hot, sometimes it is cold. Even in a hot season, even there also there is variation. Sometimes it is more hot, sometimes it is less hot. So if we start trying to control the weather, it is almost impossible. So just as the weather changes unpredictably, Similarly, our feelings will change unpredictably. And if we think our relationships are to be based on our feelings, then we cannot have stability in any relationship. Now, of course, every relationship is for the purpose where you want to experience love, you want to experience reciprocation, you want to experience joy. That is true. But our feelings keep going up and down. And if we are driven by our feelings, then we will be very unsteady. So instead of trying to control how we feel, we can focus on taking control of what we do. So if we start acting in a mood of loving service, whatever be the relationship we are in, the relationship with Krishna, in the relationship with others, now how can I act in a mood of loving service? I feel so angry with this person, I feel so annoyed with this person, I feel so disconnected with this person. But let me try how best can I serve in this situation. So if we start acting in a mode of service, we'll find that the connection will start getting established. So love is not just a noun, it's also a word. And responsible relationship means Rather than waiting for the emotion to come, we act in a way that the emotion will come gradually. Many times we start doing a particular thing, gradually the emotion starts coming. Say, if a mother has a newborn child, and normally when the mother has a child, just looking at the child, feeling the child on the lower lap, uh, seeing the child taking, uh, drinking the breast milk, that, with so much affection and joy for the mother. But suppose uh, the mother has worked long, uh, long and hard throughout the day, and then at night she is sleeping, and suddenly the baby starts crying, and the baby, the babies cry. They are like an alarm clock that goes off unpredictably. Now, and suddenly at night when the baby starts crying, at that time the mother may not feel a lot of love for the child. Initially, the emotion might just be, oh, why is she crying? Why is he crying? But then the mother will wake up and fondle the child, caress the child, comfort the child. And as she starts doing that, gradually affection starts to The child also gets comforted. So by, by taking control of how we act, we will get the appropriate feelings eventually. So in relationships, 
uh, most people, especially in today's world, they try to feel their way to actions. That means, if I feel like this, then I do like this. So I feel my way to actions. That's how most people act. Oh, I feel I like this person, so then I will live with them. Otherwise, I don't care about them. So feeling our way to actions is what makes our relationship very unsteady. Because the feelings may come sometimes, they may not come sometimes. But the other way is we act our way to feelings. We do the actions and the feelings follow. So Respons responsible relationship means we act in a mood of loving service. Even if we don't feel that right now, we act and gradually the feelings will come. And how can we act? That is why the vertical relationship comes in the picture. If we uh, understand that I am a servant of Krishna and every relationship is an opportunity for me to grow in I'm not just serving this person, I'm serving Krishna to this person. So, even if this person doesn't reciprocate with me, Krishna will reciprocate. And with that mood when we function, then there can be steadiness, there can be stability in the relationship. So, acting our way to feelings, not feeling our way to actions, that is the key to responsibility. If we start waiting for the feelings to come, then we become irresponsible. And this applies actually in every area of life. The Nobel Prize winning author, he was asked once, do you write every day or do you write only when you get inspiration? So he said, I write only when I get inspiration and I make sure that I get inspiration every morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> How, would, how, would say, how can you get inspiration according to our schedule? We cannot. But the idea is that if somebody starts doing the activity, writing is quite creative, it requires inspiration. But we can lay the ground for it. So just sit in front, sit in front of a book, start writing, sit in front of a computer, start typing. And when someone starts doing that, we act our way to the feelings. And that way, we can cultivate a sense of responsibility. And when we do this, it's, it's paradoxical, actually, it's, uh, it's curious that when we don't look simply for pleasurable feelings, that is when we get the most pleasurable feelings eventually. That means, that initially I do something which feels good, and afterward it stops feeling good. It just makes me start feeling empty. It just starts feeling so pointless. You say, I want to watch movies, I want to eat this, I want to go there, I want to go there. You just want to do things which feel good. But afterwards, they stop feeling good. But in contrast, if we do something according to our values, even when it doesn't feel good, then by doing that gradually, the good feeling that will come will not be superficial. It will be much deeper. Because we have lived in a way that is true to our values. We have connected with Krishna. We have acted in a way that is going to deepen our connection with Krishna. So that way, by acting our way to feelings, the feelings that we get are not fickle, are not ever changing, but they become very, they are not fickle and superficial, but they are steady and sublime. And that's how we can move forwards in our relationships. So, any question about this? Okay. So, yes. It's my personal experience. I want to read every day the book, no contest. But somehow, I'm not getting the feelings to read. Can I take this inspiration as even if I don't feel reading, but open it and start reading? Okay, good question. So, although we read Prabhupada's books every day, we don't get the feeling about, I want to read. So generally, bhakti sanjayate bhakti. We need to, it is by associating with devotees that we get devotion. So, when we read Shri Prabhupada's books, Prabhupada is present over there. At the same time, 
we may not be able to perceive Prabhupada's presence over there. So just like Krishna is present in the deities, but we may not always perceive Krishna's presence over there. So the same with Prabhupada's presence in his books also. That's why if we are reading, it is very helpful. In fact, it's also essential to try to share reading with someone else. That means if somebody, someone, if you have some other devotee friend also who likes to read, then make a plan that when you read, every day we share one point of what we read. Then that way it says, okay, what point should I share today? So when you are reading, that will make your reading more active. And then you'll find more points. That's one thing, sharing the reading. Second is, generally reading becomes much more enriching when it is complemented with hearing. So, if we are reading a particular section of say the Bhagavatam or if we are reading the Bhagavad Gita, then we can try to see if some Vaishnava whose classes we are able to connect with has given any classes on that topic. Sometimes when we are reading, we read at a race for space. I have to complete this candle, then I have to complete that candle, I have to complete that candle. Well, that's one way of reading. If that's what nourishes us, that's good. But some, but sometimes we find that just reading, going, reading slowly, going deep into a subject, that's what nourishes us. So, if we have say, if we are spending one hour for sadhana, then you may decide half an hour I'll read, and half an hour I'll hear on the same subject. And I'll hear from some mm, speaker with whom I'm able to connect and who has spoken on this subject. So especially if somebody is given, if we are reading a like pastime of Krishna, say we are reading the Rutras of Gita, and somebody is given a series of classes of Rutras, then hear that and then see how the pastime's appreciation increases. Especially if somebody, if we are done systematic study, like there is Bhakti Shastri courses, there is Bhakti Vaibhava courses, where the purpose of studying systematic, then essentially we start understanding Okay, how can I connect this with so many other things in scripture? So, absorption is a function of connection. When do we get absorbed in something? That is when, okay, we hear one point and then we say, oh, some other point comes in the mind. Oh, this was spoken here, that is over here, that is over here, that is over here. So, no, there are some things in which you get naturally absorbed. Some people say, like architecture. As soon as they see a new building, okay, this, this shape is like this. I saw that shape over there. Now this, this is quite stable. This is attractive. This is not that attractive. Now this is an interesting design. This is so what happens is, they start connecting what they are seeing with many other things. And to the extent that connection happens, absorption happens. So absorption is what brings satisfaction. Absorption is what brings stimulation. So for us, when we are reading something, how much are we able to connect what we read with other things? That is what will bring the stimulation and the satisfaction. And that can be developed by seeing how other speakers, other devotees, who are seasoned speakers and students of the Bhagavatam, of the Shastra, how they are doing it. So if we do these three things, share, study, hear along with study, and try to deepen our connections. Okay, how is this connected with something else? How is this connected with something else? One way to develop a connection is, many times when we are reading something, our mind says, I want, I've read this, I know this, I've heard this. So we could just turn that point around and say, okay, when was the last time I heard this? I read this point. Okay, when was the last time? What was the context over there? Oh, I heard that in that class. But in that class, if I'm reading Rudras for past time, here the point seems to be that how Rudras has to glory his death. He fought on heroically. But now when I'm hearing this, here the point is about how Rudras was in a demon's body but still he was in a boat. So what happens is, even if you look at the point, the point can be, the connections can be established also by looking at the context. There is content and there is context. So we feel this content is familiar. So, what same thing is coming again and again. 
But if we look at the content in context, okay, what context was this word portrayed last time? Oh, it was like that. Okay, this, that will lead to greater connection. If we consider Sangeet, if we consider music, music from the Vedic perspective basically has five, the basic, basic few ravas, Sari Nopadanisa. But there is so much variety of music that can come, and that comes based on how these swaras are combined together, how these various sounds are combined together. Similar, so it's not just the content, the sound, but the context, which brings absorption. So similarly, if we can look at the point in the context, connect the content with the context, and see in what different context it is used, that's how we can deepen our absorption, and that will give the taste. Okay. Yes, please. So when you said uh, <coughs> hearing also improves our uh, understanding, deepens our understanding mm -hmm. by hearing. Is there any specific uh, priorities which have been specified? Uh, going to hear, how to hear. Uh, okay. Are there any priorities about whom to hear, how to hear? Actually, we have to understand that bhakti is an individual process. And because bhakti is an individual process, so as far as priorities of hearing are concerned, uh, it is we have to find out what inspires us the most. In bhakti there are principles and there are preferences. The principle is that we have to practice the process of bhakti. For example, chanting. Doing japa is the principle. Now whether somebody sits and chants, or stands and chants, or walks and chants, somebody chants in front of the deity, somebody chants in front of the tulsi, uh, some, these are all preferences. So when the preferences are treated like principles, that is when fanaticism comes in. Every one of us is an individual. So when we go in front of the altar, now some of us may feel a great connection with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Some of us may feel a great connection with Krishna. Some of us may feel a special connection with Jagannath. This is, this, is, this is a preference and that's individuality. So in bhakti, there is, there is room for individuality. Not just room, bhakti is a process that brings out our pure spiritual individuality. So therefore, with respect to hearing, we can see what hearing nourishes us spiritually. Now sometimes some hearing may just be, we have to see that as a to nourish us spiritually. Sometimes, some devotees in their classes may crack a lot of jokes. And then, we may enjoy that. And that can be a, those classes can be stress busters. They are not spiritual nourishers. We have to be clear about that. Yes, sometimes we will be tired and then we just need some relaxation from stress. That's okay, fine. But, we cannot rate spiritual knowledge based on the laughter test. The classes that I laugh the most, all those speakers are the best. No. Yes, laughter is good, but we have to see whether I am being spiritually nourished. How do I know I am being spiritually nourished? At the end of a class, if the most important, if the thing that stays in my memory is a joke from the class, then that is not really spiritual nourishment. It's good, we can use jokes also, we can always Life can be distressing, so humor is nice. But if that is what I am remembering, then at the end of my life, at the time of death, if I am remembering a joke, then that will not be a joke. <laughs> you know, that will be a tragedy. <laughs> you want to remember Krishna at the time of death. That's why uh, we have to see what nourishes us spiritually. That means, if we hear a particular class, we hear a particular point, and that stimulates us to remember Krishna more, that deepens our remembrance of Krishna, then we can hear that more. So with respect to whom to hear or in what order to hear, after we have been in, in practicing bhakti for a few years, then this is something which will be a matter of individual preference. Okay? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. all this uh, material life, spiritual life, association and all those things. To tell 
even a vacuum kind of a thing. How do you overcome that? Then we realize that you start questioning yourself, is it all okay? And a total vacuum overshadows our thoughts for some incident which might happen and then enthusiasm goes down. How do you overcome those kind of situations to come back to normal? Mm -hmm. <coughs> what do you mean by vacuum exactly? Vacuum like we feel numb. Some incidents might happen with some association and then you know it, uh, it shakes you a lot and then you start thinking everything is okay or right or what to do. Okay. How do we regain the boost down in this part of uh, okay. Yeah. So in Bhakti, if some unpleasant, unsavory incidents happen, say some negative interaction happen with others and that makes us numb and then we lose the energy to practice what we lose. So how can we regain it at that time? One principle in bhakti is that nothing and no one should be allowed to come between us and Krishna. No relationship is as important as a relationship with Krishna. And just as attachment can be a temptation. Similarly, aversion can also be a temptation. Normally, temptation we use the word in the sense that it uses pleasure. But temptation essentially means that it distracts us from Krishna. So sometimes if we are too attached to someone, say if we are too attached to someone and we come to the temple and we are not so much interested in Darshan of the deities, we are interested in, uh, in that person. So, but sometimes the same thing, same distraction can happen if we are averse to someone. If you have had a very negative interaction with someone, we take the darshan of Krishna and we just hear that person's voice somewhere. And we hear what is he going to do? What is he going to speak about? So that aversion is also a distraction. It's also a temptation. That's why Krishna says several times in the Bhagavad Gita, Radha Dvesha Mukhrist. So, uh, this, this point I'm making to understand, this is nothing new. This is a, this is a distraction that is a time-tested distraction which Maya sends our way. That means just as Maya may tempt us, Maya may distract us through attachments. And so Maya may try to distract us even through evolution. So when that starts happening, you see that, okay, this particular devotee behaved this way or had this kind of nasty uh, interaction with this person. But this is also a test of my devotion. That ultimately, my relationship with Krishna is more important than whatever interaction I may have had. So in principle, we see this not as something where something unprecedented or catastrophic. It is, it is a predictable pitfall on the path of birth. Aversion is a predictable pitfall. When it comes, we see that as a working of Maya beyond whatever that person may have done. I gave a class in America, uh, in Silicon Valley. The theme of the class was focus not on the wrongdoer, focus on the ultimate doer. That may be a wrongdoer. See, when Parikshit Maharaj was cursed by Shringi, it was a disproportionately excessive curse for a small mistake. So Shringi was a wrong road. But throughout the Bhagavatam, we don't see any incident or any expression where Parikshit expresses anger or resentment towards Shringi. Okay, that happened, he takes shelter of Krishna. He says, focus on the ultimate doer. How can I say, now my situation has changed because of this person's actions. So in this changed situation, how can I serve Krishna? So, this doesn't mean that that wrongdoer was right. That wrongdoer was wrong. But is it, Parikshit Maharaj did not feel it was his responsibility to tell that wrongdoer. He said, I have been cursed. Uh, if that person is wrong, that between them and Krishna. So, for me, is how best I can serve Krishna in this situation. So, when we focus on the ultimate doer, when we see every situation is ultimately meant to deepen our connection with Krishna, then we can move forward steadily. And if that numbness is persisting, 
then we have to see within bhakti what is it that stimulates bhav for us. Rupa Goswami uses the word uddipan. Uddipan is spiritual stimulus. Just like for each one of us, there may be certain sense objects that may attract us. Say, now all of us want food. That's a necessity. But certain foods attract us. Say, if somebody is uh, South Indian, as soon as they hear you are of Idli Sampa, Dosa, then they get excited. Somebody is Punjabi, then Parakas. Somebody is Gujarati, then maybe Kakra. So, like that, food is universal. But there will be specific foods that attract us. So, just as in material life, there are particular sense objects that, that attract us and trigger emotion within us. Similarly, in spiritual life, for all of us, there will be particular stimuli that trigger emotion in us. So for some of us, it may be a particular darshan of the deities. Not just deities, but a particular deity and a particular darshan of the deities. When they dress with this color dress, oh, they look so attractive, I feel so attractive. Or it may be kirtan, not just kirtan, but maybe a particular Hare Krishna dhun sung by a particular devotee. It may be bhajans. Oh, this bhajan, when it is sung in this way, I feel so enriched by it. So that way, when we see what is it that can stimulate us spiritually, it may be a particular devotee's class, again, as we discussed about earlier. So then we have to put ourselves in Krishna's gravity pull by bringing those stimuli close to us. So Krishna has a gravity pull and Maya has a gravity pull. So Maya's gravity pull takes us away from Krishna and makes us numb to Krishna. But then when we feel numb, we have to put ourselves in Krishna's gravity pull. How? Krishna, when we put ourselves in Krishna's gravity pull, it will attract us to us. But how do we put ourselves there? By exposing our consciousness to the particular deepen that stimulates us. So by that the numbness can be overcome. So any other questions? Okay, so I'll make one last point and then if there are any other questions, we can discuss that. So ultimately, when we are talking about responsible relationships, there is, <coughs> there is in responsibility, there are two aspects to it. There is when to take control and when to let go of control. Responsibility is in both senses. That, so I say, when a child is small, the parent's responsibility is to guide, protect, take care of the child. When the parent grows up, at that time, the parents need to provide the child wings to fly. The parents need to let go of the child. If a 25-year-old child, the parents try to control that child the way a 5-year-old child will control. Not only will the child be choked, but the child will not be able to grow. The child will be un not only be unhappy, but not also not be able to mature. So in every relationship, there is, there is taking control and there is ceding control. There is letting go of things. So sometimes when we are in a particular relationship, we expect the other person. They should be like this. But when they are not like that, we may try to persuade them, we may try to explain things to them, but if that is not working, then we need to let go. Let go doesn't mean that we let go of the relationship itself. It just means that that particular aspect may just not be changing. And then it requires strength to let go. Normally we think of it requires strength to hold on. That is true. But it also requires strength to let go. Because when we let go, we are actually also letting go of our attachment. So there is a difference between the responsibility and attachment. That is the point which I conclude. See, responsible attachment means that we hold on to that relationship, that object, uh, that person, 
whatever be the cost. So, for example, the Drashtra was attached to Yudhudha. That what happened in that case, that whatever Duryodhan did, the Drashtra couldn't say no. Because he was attached. So attachment in the relationship means that we just don't think of the costs in the relationship. We just act irrespective of the costs. So that is, uh, so he could never let go of the rhythm. And that's what created big, big problems for him. Virudhur, right from his birth, uh, birth of Virudhur told him, Dhritarashtra, you have 99 more sons. This one son, if you keep him, he will cause the destruction of your whole dynasty. Now when Virudhur told Dhritarashtra, you give up this, give up this son. That doesn't mean he has to be responsible and just throw us on the streets. He could have handed over the son to someone else. It is Duryodhan, because he got all that royal comfort, he became, he felt entitled to that. And that made him more arrogant. That made him more insecure when that was taken away from him. That made him more envious when the Pandavas got all that. So he might, he had some evil tendencies. But if he had not got royal power, he would not have been that from that universe. So the Dhrashtra could not let go. Attachment means we want to continue the relationship no matter what the cost. But responsibility means that we see the relationship as a service to Krishna. And we understand that this is service to Krishna, so I will do it as well as I can. But this relationship is not my only service to Krishna. There are different ways in which I serve Krishna. So if we consider our consciousness to be like water, and the various relationships we have, they are like channels through which the water of our consciousness is meant to go towards the ocean. And that ocean is Krishna. That ocean is Krishna. So through the various abilities that we undertake in those relationships, all the services that we do in those relationships, they are all meant to be channels for the water of our consciousness to reach Krishna. Now, we would like from all our relationships, from all the channels, the water to go to Krishna. But sometimes a particular channel may get blocked. Now, because the channel has got blocked, that does not mean the river should be. If the channel is blocked, okay. I try to unblock this channel, it's not letting unblock. We'll keep trying over here. But let the water move towards through the other channels. So letting go means that we, if a particular relationship is not working out, that doesn't mean we abandon it, but it just means that we don't obsess so much on it that we lose perspective. This is a service to Krishna, it's an important service to Krishna, but if this service to Krishna doesn't work out, still there are other services like it. Say, hey, if we are trying, if we say distribute books, or if we do classes, or if we do kirtans, or if we do puja, if we do cooking, each one of these is a service to Krishna. And we would like to do it as well as we can. But suppose situations change, and a particular service that we are doing, we are no longer able to do that, for whatever reason. Now that doesn't mean, that our relationship with Krishna is stopped. If this service is not possible, there are other services I can do. So when we see a relationship as a service to Krishna, then there can be both responsibility and detachment. How? Responsibility because well, it's a service to Krishna, let me do it the best that I can. But detachment because I understand that I am not the control. It is Krishna who is the controller. And if somehow this particular thing is not working out, this channel is blocked, then I will make sure that my other services go on, that the water of my consciousness moves towards Krishna through the other channels. And that way we can move forward peacefully, even if there is disruption in our life. We may not be peaceful always, but we can at least be purposeful. But okay, this is not working out. This will cause some agitation, but purposefully we move towards Krishna 
through whatever services we can do, whatever relationships are moving forward, we move forward and, and no channel stays blocked forever. Eventually that blockage will also go away. But just because the channel is blocked, channel of our consciousness is blocked, doesn't mean our consciousness should get blocked. We can move forward steadily through the other channels. And by Krishna's plan, eventually that channel will also be unlocked. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of <clears throat> focus first on the vertical relationship with Look up before we look around. I spoke three points. First is that our defining identity should be, our defining relationship should be our vertical relationship with Krishna, not the horizontal relationships. This is what is eternal. And if we can get strength and stability to that through that relationship, then even if there are disruptions in the horizontal relationships, we will see them as bumps on the road of life. But if the horizontal relationship itself has become our defining relationship, then a problem in that relationship.